Welcome back to the channel, my name is Lanza, and today we'll be breaking down episode 3 of Hell's Paradise. The release of this video was slightly delayed as I needed to rewatch the episode and cover my corners by rereading the manga to ensure the accuracy of my comments in this video. If you're new to the channel, then allow me to explain the layout of this video. First, I'll provide a brief summary of the major points of this episode. Second, I'll break down the contents of this episode and provide my thoughts. Thirdly, we'll take a look at audience reception and gauge overall opinion. If this is your first time here, then welcome! Consider subscribing for more content like this. If you're a returning watcher, then leave a like. Those are greatly appreciated. Without further ado, let's begin with an episode summary of Hell's Paradise Episode 3. The episode begins with a flashback from Gabimaru's perspective. We watch as dozens of ninja deliver attacks against the village chief, who appears seemingly unfazed. This flashback is used as evidence to assume that the village chief has already drunk the elixir of life, meaning that it truly does exist. Returning to the present, Gabimaru and Sagiri walk through the island as they are both surprised and cautious of the vibrant forestry. While Gabimaru complains of having to bind his hands, they are attacked by one of the ten criminals, Twisted Kayun, a warrior monk. Gabimaru finishes this fight extremely quickly. Kisho, another Asaemon, explains that since disembarkment, this expedition will veer off course as we see a montage of Asaemon and criminals being murdered by one another. As Kisho leaves, he mentions that the village of ninjas is sending their own unit to capture the elixir of life on the island. Gabimaru then attacks Sagiri, stating that he needs to complete this mission before the rest of the ninja team arrives. As they both realize they can't kill each other due to their emotional connection, they come to an agreement of continuing together. The episode ends on shots of island monstrosities attacking the different pairs as everyone prepares for battle. Unlike episodes 1 and 2, which respectively adapted manga chapters 1 and 2, episode 3 decides to adapt the next three chapters, 3, 4, 5. I want to state this first because this episode was packed with important information that will be relevant later on in the series. Regardless, if you take away your attention from this episode, it's clear that you might miss out on something important. The animation so far has satisfied my criteria. More specifically, the color saturation applied to the forestry on the island. This has been the most colorful episode so far, because in the past two episodes we've been stuck in a dungeon or on a lifeless beach. This color and design flair is also shared by the inhabitants of the island as we see demon butterflies that have NTR fat bastard heads attached to where their heads are, and creepy centipedes that have human fingers to crawl. One of the unique aspects of Hell's Paradise is the complex life forms that have grown on the island, and so far, based on the ending of this episode, we are privy to these oversized karate man fish monsters. The danger of this island has been highlighted with the aid of animation and color choice. The fighting animation shares the same bonus as the short clashes between Gabimaru and Sagiri are heightened with beautiful fluidity. While the fight between Gabimaru and Twisted Kayun was never meant to be prolonged, I enjoy the brisk conflict. There was only one specific shot in the episode that felt a bit strange, almost reminding me of the stagnant Record of Ragnarok emphasized designs, but aside from that quick shot, the fight overall was fine. At this point, what really more can be said about the animation? As we continue on throughout the season, I'll speak less on animation, as it's doing a satisfactory job and I don't really want to repeat myself every single episode just talking about how great the animation is. But let's take a look at this episode's main head-turner. The fact that a good portion of the participants in this expedition are killed off from the other visitors. The notable death of this episode was Aizen, the first rank Yamada Asemon. There's many points I want to bring up relating to this character and the manner in which he died. While Aizen is ranked first, he's not the strongest executioner. In fact, his abilities aren't even that remarkable. I remember that in the manga, Aizen's title of first rank gave the impression of his superior swordsmanship. However, the Yamada Asemon first rank isn't based on skill, but rather on an overall holistic analysis of the individual. This information would have been extremely important to receive for the audience if it was stated before he died. Upon his death, audience goers might be confused on why a head honcho like himself would be so easily one-shot. Another minor point that led me to a different theory on why he was killed off so quickly was that when Kisho was explaining the purpose of this island's expedition, he stated that there were rumors that the success of this mission could determine the next head of the clan. When I first read in the manga, I had assumed that maybe an overzealous Asaemon had swapped out Aizen's sword for a more fragile one that could break easily, which prompted Aizen's surprise reaction to his sword being broken. Even so, why was Aizen so surprised that he had lost in this quick melee against Rokuroda? Don't these Asaemon know how dangerous these criminals are? Well, it just leads me back to Aizen's own superiority complex. Don't forget that in the second episode, my man was already telling Sagiri to stay at home and play housewife, since this mission was 
beyond her skill level. Aizen's weakness of biting off more than he can chew is on full display as his upper half is completely obliterated by Rokuroda's hand. I would like to mention at least that I was fairly disappointed with the animations team's efforts to not animate the impact of Rokuroda's hand smashing Aizen into a tree. I really felt the record of Ragnarok PowerPoint slides in full effect as we see surprised Aizen cutting to an Aizen's upper half being squashed. I felt like the manga had a more dynamic presentation with his death, but it's not a deal breaker for this episode. Speaking of death, we take a look at the rest of the pairs and realize we're in complete chaos as several criminals are being killed or betrayed. I mentioned before that having to juggle 10 criminals and 10 Asemon was already a huge obstacle, so I'm glad that the author managed to cull off a portion of them by the beginning, at least before we really sank our love into the specifics of them. Killing is an ordinary action on this island, and by removing more characters we can finally start to focus on the ones who have more weight to them. Like honestly, as hot as Cannibal Courtesan is, she wasn't going to carry this anime. That or this freaky looking stretching man who reminds me of a Street Fighter character. This episode did provide us with an insider scoop of Gabimaru's fears, showing that he truly isn't a paragon of mental fortitude. Gabimaru is worried about the eventual arrival of an elite unit of ninja from his village who have been separately tasked by their chief to take the elixir of life. This island on its own already holds the capacity to kill any visitor, as seen when Tamiya slices off his hand when he realizes that the insects of this island have venom that can morph an individual's body into more forestry. The deadly island, coupled with a unit of killers, spells only more disaster for Gabimaru as his ultimate goal of seeing his wife, once again, is torn down. Keep in mind that Gabimaru is no longer part of the ninja village after he was arrested. We cannot assume that this envoy of ninja will be specifically friendly. The scene of an impending group of characters reaching the island reminds me of the role of the Ginyu Force from Dragon Ball Z. The heroes, quote unquote, are now given a time limit instead of being given as much time as they want on the island. Desperation kicks in as Gabimaru heads straight to attack Sagiri. He figures that she is only an anchor and attempts his best to kill her. Aside from Gabimaru's fears, we are also shown that he's quite irrational when it comes to his wife. In past missions, Gabimaru is known for straying off course from the objective when individuals or potential targets insult his wife or use the concept of marriage as a sympathetic angle. This irrationality is, in his opinion, a weakness that will serve to be his downfall on the island. Sagiri is able to explain to Gabimaru that emotions, caring, is not necessarily a bad thing and that restraint when killing shows how strong a person or an individual really is. Sagiri, on the other hand, is more curious and wants to see how Gabimaru develops throughout the journey of the island. She understands that he has killed many, but wants to know if it's possible to rehabilitate oneself from an extremely violent past. This episode serves the major function of bringing together our two main protagonists into an amicable relationship. While it's not overtly friendly, as some are accustomed to, they have formed a temporary truce and understand why the other side can't bring themselves to bring the knife down on the other. This relationship has the potential to blossom into something heartfelt, such as when we saw how overly demanding Sagiri can be and showing her stickiness to the rules by having to bind Gabimaru's hands. The two are capable of so much more, and I'm happy that the voice acting can further heighten the comedy between the two. Lastly, aside from the pure chaos and relationship strengthening, we finally get to take a look at Kisho, one of the Yamada Asemon who is essentially an employee who realizes his job is not that worth it. Looking at the overall mission of sending 10 of your best executioners to an island that so far has been a 100% death rate with criminals, who are also absurdly dangerous, is a horrible idea. But we're looking at this from a rational point of view. The Shogun, as most despotic leaders, want power and understand the potential of an elixir that provides immortality. He is especially concerned, I would assume, that he's heard rumors of the chief of the ninja village also having access to immortality. From his view, he assumes that this mission will be a success as we are sending elite swordsmen and powerful criminals who can fight off whatever attacked the previous envoys to the island. The criminals are being strong-armed into joining this adventure anyway. You may wonder why didn't the criminals just work together to escape the beach pre-voyage. This is a legitimate concern, considering that one of the criminals was easily able to kill Aizen in one hit. Let's keep in mind that these criminals are not invincible. Remember that Gabimaru, an exceptionally strong individual, was captured at the beginning of this story and was shown to be susceptible to beheadings from a skilled swordsman. Now add in the fact that the Shogun is offering a full pardon, an opportunity to absolve all previous crimes where a criminal can have a second life. No need to be fearful of being constantly on the run from the government. Can you imagine Gabimaru needing to protect his wife until his last dying days? 
one really only needs to take a look at Berserk and realize that a life on the run while protecting someone is physically and mentally draining to the point of collapse. Kisho realizes the absurdity of this mission and just decides to fuck it. He's free to return back to the mainland after his criminal was killed off. I would argue that the theme of this episode is conflict, but more so on the individual skirmishes laid out before us. In battles, one need not play by the rules. Sagiri is handicapping herself by making Gabimaru follow the rules, while those same rules are being trampled upon by the other criminals throughout the island. Overall, this episode is like kicking the boulder down a tall mountain. We have started our journey into the island, and so far it's already developed into chaos. One thing to note as we begin our look at public reception is that in the same week, the anime Oshinoko has finally debuted, a highly anticipated anime due to its renowned author's work in Kaguya Love is War. We also received episode 2 of Demon Slayer's newest season. It's always important to understand what's going on in the ecosystem as it may influence the audience's perspective. One may see Oshi's dazzling animation to Hell's Paradise's janky faces at times. One cannot help but compare the two. But let's start our survey on how others felt about this episode. Comment number one states, Did not expect Eyepatch to die that fast. I'm glad that a good chunk of discussion of this latest episode is surrounding Aizen's death. He talked a big game, but was killed by a big hand. It may confuse many seeing as how he is one of the major links related to Sagiri's backstory and considering that he seemed extremely important, ultimately dying so quickly in this expedition. I'm excited for the rest of the audience's reactions to the different deaths throughout the island's journey. I think we've spoken at length on the questions surrounding Zizen's death earlier, and so we can take a look at a different piece of feedback. Comment number two states, Sagiri in episode one. I knew it. This man is dangerous. Episode two. I knew it. This man is dangerous. Episode three. I knew it. This man is dangerous. How many of you viewers are willing to bet on the fact that Sagiri might say the same thing again in the fourth episode? Sagiri sounds like a broken record at this point, but I think it's a way to remind herself that Gabimaru, while having a softer and gentler side, is still a man who has murdered probably thousands. It may seem repetitive, but I personally think that she's saying this to separate her feelings she has towards him and his actual actions so far. She reminds herself how dangerous he is whenever he shows a weaker side to him, meaning that she doesn't want to be completely blindsided if he does something absolutely crazy, such as when he leaped at her in this episode and tried to kill her. I know for the audience we might find this annoying. I can only hope that the showrunners are purposefully reminding us over and over again so that we can remember if he ever does something extremely fucked up. Comment number three states, Oh look, another edgy shonen. With hindsight, I have to say that this comment, while not true, can definitely appear to be true to others. Gabimaru hasn't really distinguished himself as a unique character, and most of the dialogue has been centered around killing and murdering. To the untrained mind, one will connect these edgy buzzwords and assume that it's another generic main character who is incredibly overpowered, but he's so sad that he's just so strong. I think the way Hell's Paradise treats this character in the latter half is unique, but we'll have to wait for that. Even then, his sad emotions are all connected to the fact that Gabimaru just really misses his wife. She's the reason he has purpose in his life aside from being a killing machine. I think that the audience will really understand this as we progress throughout the story. Comment number four states this. Screw the elixir. After seeing those creatures, I say just nuke the whole island and be done with it. This comment brought a smile to my face knowing that the preliminary monsters we have gotten to see are terrifyingly brought to life through animation. Things only get weirder from this point on. I think what really sells the inherent creepiness is the butterflies with the ability to turn anyone into a plant with their stingers. One of this manga's core positives is its ability to blow you away with the bizarre concepts on the island. I think that so far the manga has been adapted fine. One criticism is by trying to avoid a large info dump while some of the more important fighting slash killing is happening. It can distract a viewer, like what happened in this episode. I think that when we finally enter a legit fight between Gabimaru and other island characters that will be in for a real treat. With that being said, I think that summarizes this episode's weekly breakdown. Stay tuned for next week's episode 4, where the fighting reaches a particular sweet spot. Take care.